to uh, Revelation Happens. I'm actually calling this series Revelation Concludes because um, I did an intro last week and my point is uh, we're already looking at it and we're already well into it. In fact, uh, I put together a uh, PDF for us. So, uh, and I put on here uh, my website, my YouTube channel, and then you can see the uh, last one I uploaded, Revelation Concludes by Sorcery, part one. So this will technically be part two where we'll get into uh, looking at the meat of the things we're showing here. And I, I put on here uh, September 2017, but actually the, there were two dates, uh, September 23rd, 2017, and October 13th, 2017. So that time period is when the start would be. And uh, that would also vary uh, the end of the seven year tribulation. So I put 420, 2024. Uh, but that, and then that could vary by, uh, well, three months in reality, to about two and a half months. But if those uh, dates are the relevant dates, so that's just uh, my, what I'm teaching here. And uh, so let's just start with this. I put on here, start this teaching series, watch the Revelation Concludes video part one, which I just showed. And I've got it in this PDF, the links at the end of the PDF. And that was a uh, connection to my background info, uh, where you can find the videos I've already done, all that kind of thing. And then in part two, I'm going to explain what sorcery is, how it's defined in scripture, and how it has deceived the whole world. At this point right now, that's what we're looking at on TV. If people are watching TV, that's what they're looking at. So I didn't necessarily know that's how Revelation would start, but that is what it teaches. So we're going to look at that. To me, the key events to understand in Revelation are illustrated by the fact one group of wicked people are trying to kill off a group called the holy people. And I'm going to start with my chart, which is Revelation, uh, uh, the millennium period, in other words, summary one, and start at the top. And then we're going to look at the bottom. So. I put on here in the first five verses of Revelation, we'll read that Christ is sending John, his servant, to other servants defined as people who are loved by Christ, who is the angel sent by God. So, I don't, not, you know, this is teaching uh, the 144,000 here. Uh, this is not for entertainment, so if you're going to follow along, you should have uh, your Bible, uh, have it uh in Revelation, that's all we're really going to uh, look for at the moment. And then we're going to connect back to Isaiah and Jeremiah and all these other verses that I'm going to quote. So I'm not going to uh, display all this on the screen. We're going to work right off my uh, PDF. And then from there, you have all your cross references and things you need to go look at in your Bible. So I could... Uh, do it for entertainment purposes, but then uh, this is a little bit higher uh, level teaching here for people that really want to study, which is the reason I don't bother doing all that. I'll just give you the core information and let you look everything up yourself. Let's try to explain the logic and the interconnection of prophecy. That's what we're trying to do. So they are blessed because they keep the prophecy of Revelation. They attend churches or congregations of Israelites and are washed from their sins by Christ. So that's the context of the first five verses of Revelation. Revelation 1, 6, and 7, it gets more definitive. So I think uh, we can pretty much... Uh, figure out all the context of Revelation if we just look at what it starts with really in the first five, five verses. So Revelation 1, 6, and 7 says they're made kings and priests unto God and his Father. It also says they're kindred people. That's a key thing. And all of them will wail when they see Christ. And they're fine wail to make a, a weep or wail, in other words. 
So connecting the dots in just these seven verses, you could positively identify who the God's covenant people are. And I use my initialisms here. And I have a full list of those on my one of my other uh, documents, which I state at the end. So looking at Revelation, it starts with servants. So we look at Strong's and see how this term is used. And here are the key verses, which all use the term servants. So if we go over to my Revelation Millennium Period, you can see, uh, so we're looking at verse uh, 1, 1 as servants, and you can find this on my site, you can get all these documents for free, just uh, click, go to my website and download. So servants, I have, uh, this is the actual chart, and I have it uh, blown up a little bit here. It's actually a four foot by five foot uh, size chart, so it's a pretty good size. And uh, they're in image format, so I have PDFs and images on the site that you can all download. So the servant was as a messenger. In other words, John was a messenger of uh, a word that was given to him uh, by Christ. In other words, and service defined as voluntary service of a Christian then through various capacities. And it can be also used uh, serve or service. So all these terms should be looked up if you want to get a full definition. So God had sent his messenger John then, and it says that in Revelation 22 6. So in 1 3, the people who hear and observe the prophecy or what's written therein also connects, you see, my right arrow means that cross references to 22, 2 and 7 in Revelation. 79 I mean so these are conquerors in 1 3 1 4 the seven churches or assemblies or congregations of Israel people that's the first use of the term church and then the one who is who was and who comes of course is Jehovah or Christ the seven spirits before the throne I give you a uh, Cross references it's called seven eyes, there in Zechariah 3 9 4 10. Seven angels or messengers. One five, the true witness, first begotten from the dead, of course, is Christ, the prince or commander of the kings of the earth, and all references to his law or commands, or he commanded it, commanded his people to do something. So the us in verse 5. Are those uh, washed from their sins by Christ's blood. Verse 6, the kings, the kings over a kingdom. In other words, kings are always kings over some kingdom. And then you have your kings and priests, or your kingdom priests. If you look at your cross-reference, it'll go back to Exodus 19.6. Or it'll go to 1 Peter 2, 5, uh, and 9. So right here it'll be like, 1 Peter 2, 9 or 10, whichever. And then 1 Peter would go back to Exodus. And then I put your other uh, connections here because the, you have the royal priesthood, the holy priesthood, and the everlasting priesthood. Actually, I have everlasting uh, priesthood on a, a newer, this is an older copy of this uh, chart. And I have a newer copy of it. Those also connect to, in other words, the kings and priests, Revelation 5, 10, and it connects to cross-references, in other words, 20 and 6. The kindreds of the earth shall well or lament over Christ when they see him. So the kindreds would be Christian people, uh, people who don't have anything uh, to do with Christ and don't want him, would not well lament over Christ when they see him. The ones that will well lament are the kindreds, people that are being, uh, in other words, kindred Israel, that are being uh, killed off, and the ones that are being murdered are the Christian Israel people. So, and that comes from the word uh, race or tribe, if you look it up in Strong's. In Webster, it says their uh, kindreds are related by birth, family, or marriage. So, it's not, kindreds are not, uh, 
people of different races, and uh, you know, they're they're it's a very specific term: birth, family, or marriage. And those connections are five nine, seven nine, eleven nine, thirteen seven, and fourteen six about the kindreds. So let me go back. The servants start in Revelation one one two twenty seven three eleven seven. And if God bless you to hear, so my point is, if you know anything about Revelation, you've studied it. At least two of these on uh, servants should stand out like a flashing neon sign, because chapter seven identifies exactly who the hundred forty-four thousand from the twelve tribes are. Chapter fifteen is about the conquerors who didn't take the mark of the beast in the revelation, which is what the book of Revelation is. It's one revelation, and it's uh, taking place at the second coming, so at the end time. So you have conquerors, chapter 15, and these conquerors are the 144,000 from chapter 14. And chapter 14 is got absolutely about the 12 kindred tribes because it refers back to the 144,000 in chapter 7, which identifies so many from each tribe. So that's two connections to the 12 tribes and what describe Christian Israel. But 22 3 and 6 in Revelation are just as important. If you look back at the chart, it's hard to miss all the repeating 12 starting with 2112. There's 12 gates, 12 tribes, 12 angels, and then 2114, 12 foundation courses, 12 apostles, and you have 12 gates, 12 pearls, 12 fruits. Then the servants are serving the Lamb equals Christ. All right, so let's look at, go back to the chart there. So if you go over here, 21, 12, in other words, so you have the whole point about this chart is these things are all connected. In other words, you got the white horse, Christ coming with his armies, and his armies are Israelites killed from chapter 11. They were beheaded, and you have these people, and these were Israelites, because you only have a description of Israelites being the book of life. Israelites related, connected to the New Jerusalem and the tabernacle. The fountain of water of life is given to Israelites who are identified as conquerors, as we just saw. Like I said, you got your 12 gates with names inscribed to the 12 tribes, 12 foundation courses with 12 names of 12 apostles. Okay. New Jerusalem is uh, basically described as a 1,500 square mile pyramid, not a cube. And then your foundations are decorated with precious stones, which are the stones that apply to all 12 tribes. And that goes back to Isaiah and Exodus. 12 gates or 12 pearls. Christ's lamp, the 12 crops, of course, are the offspring of the family tree of the 12 tribes. And then the leaves, the tree for the healing of the nation. So I'll put the children who bless and help heathen nations to follow God's law. That's from Zechariah and Isaiah. And then the righteous. Okay. So on 22.7, we have the blessed. That's the second part we're going to look at is he who keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of the book, speaking of the book of the Revelation. Then consider 22.9, them which keep the sayings of this book, which we just looked at, 22.7.9. I mentioned that cross reference. So how can you do what your rev uh, revelation says if your pastor hasn't connected the dots on the terminology and you don't really understand how to apply it to your life in modern day? Exactly. A lot of pastors that just skip over Revelation don't want to teach it because they say it's too hard, too difficult. But in reality, it's uh, not as, nearly as difficult as uh, you'll see once you just uh, read it and connect the dots and look at your cross-references. So, let's start out by considering the kings and priests. Anyone in the Bible knows where that comes from. A cross-reference Bible confirms it. If you're 
your Bible, I said may cross-reference the royal priesthood in 1 Peter 2, 9, but when that, when you read that, it reads like a quote to Exodus 19, 6. It was the first promise, Christ or Yehoah, that's who Christ is, and we'll get to that. He made it to the 12 kindred tribes at Mount Sinai. If you read Exodus 19, 2 through 6, and notice verse 4, I bear you on eagles' wings, that verse connects to Daniel chapter 4, which cross-references to Revelation chapter 13. Because of the way it cross-references, I teach that Daniel chapter 7 is just a shorter, condensed version of Revelation using similar terminology. It's where we get our definitions of a beast as a military coalition or a beast government because it's uh, multiple nations coming together. And the beast government just means it's strong enough to go out and conquer other nations. The other thing about kings and priests is that it's the description of the Melchizedek priesthood, which is mentioned a few times in Scripture, starting in Genesis chapter 14. It means king of righteousness and king of peace, because it cross-references to Hebrew chapter 7, where it's defined for us there. However, the cross-reference and the quotes in your Bible are completely useless if you think all the prophecies of the Old Testament now apply to just anyone on earth. All the prophecies about the first and second coming of Christ are in the Old Testament. Those promises are to the 12 tribes specifically. Everybody teaches the Old Testament, teaches it's all about the 12 tribes over there, or the Israel people, and it's really specifically about Christian Israel in reality. But you have two groups. So I'm saying, where's the prophecy that says this context will change from the 12 tribes to whosoever will? Because there's no prophecy like that in the Old Testament. And Christ, all Christ quoted was Old Testament prophecies, like 300 quotes in the New Testament. So think about it. For a prophecy to be true, it has to happen as stated. So if the prophecy of the first coming, of Christ and the prophecy of the second coming of Christ are in the Old Testament and they're made to come true to the 12 kindred tribes and that's what they have to that's how it has to happen and the people that comes true to are people that believed in Christ in the Old Testament and the New Testament so it's about Christian Israel so the servants being sealed in Revelation 7-3 are called 144,000 of the 12 kindred tribes. The servants in 10-7 are mentioned as the prophets who wrote all these prophecies in the Bible. The servants in 11-18 are connected with the prophets and saints. Just before in 11-16, we had the 24 elders, which are defined as 12 kindred tribes. And we're in the chapter about the two witnesses which have power from God in 11.3. So, hmm, I thought the people who had power with God, and there's my initialism, was the definition of the word Israel. Reigning with God, in other words, power with God. Everyone defines these two witnesses as two Israelite people or men. I don't, but I'm showing you the logic because it's a forgotten prophecy about Christian Israel. It goes all the way back to Genesis. So, okay, 15.3 are people who had gotten victory over the beast and the mark of the beast. They sing the song of Moses, where just before in 14.3 it told us that only the 144,000 which were redeemed could learn that song, the song of Moses. And that came from 7-3 and the 144,000 of the 12 tribes. We've said that. But the Song of Moses actually goes back to 5-9, if you're paying attention to Strong. So, reading 5-9, these are kindred people who were redeemed by the Lamb. They're living in various nations, speaking different tongues, meaning languages. They are made into kings and priests to reign over the earth. And the 24 elders are mentioned with them. Kings and priests are really a prophecy to Abraham uh, and Sarah in Genesis. And that's where we're going, to connect those dots. In Genesis, we do know of one group of people in prophecy who were prophesied twice to be 12 
kindred tribes of kings and priests divided into a commonwealth of Christian nations and a great Christian nation who were to be redeemed in the end time by Jehovah. So, I wonder what the odds are if these people in Old Testament prophecy could be related to the ones in the Revelation prophecy. The Revelation is the conclusion to find the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecy about Jehovah and his people in the first coming and the second coming to the servants of the twelve kindred tribes as servants, saints, holy, conquerors, blessed, redeemed, etc. Number of terms, all the same people. Talking about just anyone. So, back to servants, 19.2 and 19.5. This is just after the servants were being killed by Babylon the Great. 24 elders mentioned, there's praise for servants that fear Yehoah, so Christian, again. They're blessed for being called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, Christian men. We can see it's a wrap on all the wars by the end of chapter 19, and these armies of Babylon are arrayed against Christ and his army. All right, his army are again Christian Israel people. The beast and false prophet lose, and they're judged with fire. It mentions an angel with his foot in the sun, so I just say it's kind of using his fuel, I guess, for the sun. And, uh, but it also includes those who accepted the mark of the beast. Uh, I assume that's whether they were Israelites or not. So that covers the words, the term servants. So let's look at the people who were called blessed. There are Revelation 1, 3, 14, 3, 16, 5. And there's your list. Now, I guess, uh, do that, I'm going to need to click over to the other chart because this doesn't have blessed on it. Let's see, it's in the bottom. Oh. Okay. Two. All right, let's send me two on the top, and there's my list. So Summary two on the top right hand side is where just above the two witnesses chart is where I have the list of all the blessed in the New Testament. So blessed are the readers, that's one three, hearers of the prophecy who keep the things written therein or who observe its records depending on which version of King James you have. And this also connects to 1217. The remnant of her seed, which is talking about 12 tribes, which keep the commandments of God and cling to the evidence of Jesus. Now we're going to connect that uh, to Christian Israel here in a minute because in 1412, remember these are the 144,000 of the 12 tribes, it says they're a consolation for the holy, those who keep the commands of God and the faith of Christ. And that refers back to verse 4, which are the 144,000. Then in 14.13, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from now. now I probably should cross-reference that because that would go back to uh, 6, 4, 5 possibly where their brethren were going to be killed. And again, it's 12 tribes. Blessed are the watcher who clings to his clothing. That's just a figure of speech. Uh, but it does mention... Uh, dirty in your clothing, in other words, is not following his law. So the one that follows his law is what that's talking about. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, which are going to be Christian people. And again, that connects over to blessed is the keeper of the statements of the prophecy of the book. So you see all these are interconnected. Blessed, 26 is blessed and holy as a participator in the first resurrection. Blessed is the keeper of the statements. We read that. 22.14, blessed are those which do his commandments. Follow his law, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. In other words, we're still talking about 12 tribes. All these are connected. And I missed a couple here at the beginning. 2.26 are those who obey my laws. Again, those are blessed. And uh, in other words, follow his law. 3.8. 
kept my word, which is another way of saying follow my law, and 319, zealous for his word, another way of saying following his law. So these are all blessed people, and they're all 12 tribes. Now, uh, let me... Wrong screen. <clears throat> okay, so start with one three, where it says they are blessed because they keep the prophecy of Revelation. Then we see that they attend churches and are washed from their sins by Christ. That's how they're so they're Christian people who attend congregations of Israelites, and we just call that churches. So in fourteen thirteen, the blessed are connected to the saints. In fourteen twelve, who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Plus, we already know chapter 14 is about the 144,000 of the redeemed, first fruits unto God and the Lamb. From the 12 kindred tribes who don't accept the mark of the beast. So if you're, if you're, uh, Christian, obviously, you can't accept the mark of the beast. I was going to look at something else. And I just put on here that's a pretty good definition of who Christian Israel is. In other words, we're, they all interconnect here in Revelation as Israel people, and they're all interconnect as Christian people. You just got to keep it in context, and we're trying to show that. And if you read it through, you might have to go through again. But uh, you'll see by the time we get to the end, it's all, all the dots connect. So 1615, I said the language is a little bit more symbolic, but compared to other verses we're reading, it all fits together. In 199, the blessed are the saints called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, again, Christian people, which were also called servants and conquerors. So all the terms interconnect. 26 is the blessed and holy, which are beheaded for the witness of Jesus. So again, they're Christian people. <sighs> which is from 24, about those who didn't take the mark of the beast. Christian Israel, 144,000, which cross-reference back to 15.3 as victors over the beast. And the, one, the victors over the beast came from the 144,000 redeemed first fruit of the 112 kindred tribes in 14.3. And that came from the two conquered lamb kingdoms in 13.11. From the conquered kindred saints or nations in 13.7 who were from the children of Sarah as the crown of 12 stars. In other words, the 12 kindred tribes who are at war with the beast in 1217. That comes from the conquered two witnesses who have power with God in 117 that are conquered. They were living in two prophetic nations of the 12 tribes as his servants, the prophets, teaching this mystery to their kindred in different languages in 10, 7, and 11. So if you just back up, start from the end and back up, you see the connections in reverse. So that's why I'm showing you. That's from the saints of the 12 tribes who make prayers heard by Yehoah in 8, 3, and 4. The people who make prayers are Christian people. Okay, but it specifically connects them to the 144,000 of 12 kindred tribes. Okay, If you just go work it backwards, which you're doing, you can see that. Because these in 8, 3, and 4 came from the 144,000 of the 12 kindred tribes along with their brethren in 7, 3. See? So if you go forward, it's the same group of people. People teach this is just whoever, but in fact, from one chapter to the next, it all connects. They're Christian Israel people, and not just whoever. If you go back from 7-3, that was from their brethren, as the 12 kindred tribes already murdered for their testimony of Christ in 6-9-11. through 11. 
All right, well, who's murdered for the testimony of Christ except Christian people? And the ones of 6 9 came from the redeemed 12 kindred tribes promised to reign as kings and priests in 5 9. Now they were in different nations speaking different languages. I already said 5 9 connected to 1 6 and 7. Same group of people. So, these in 5 9 then are ones who attended the congregations of Christian Israel called churches in chapter 2 through 3. They're not churches that just had whoever walking in the door. A congregation was first really a church at Mount Sinai. I think it was Stephen that pointed that out. At any rate, the churches are those from the kindred, kings, and priests in 1 6 and 7 who are the servants of Jehovah as his administrators of justice. So, they're made priests of God and Christ in chapter 20, who sit on thrones, meeting out justice, it says, for a thousand years. And what pastor could not logically connect those dots if you, they've earned a degree in seminary? Yes. Who would take all of these mentions of the 12 tribes clearly sits in perfect context from one chapter to the next and then say, separate it all and say, oh, over here it's one group of people, over there it's a different group of people. Now, who would do that? So, I'm saying they're not disconnected people. They're just read that way. So, in 22.7, again, it says, Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book, which is the same as 1.3, and in 22, 14, blessed are they which do his commandments, that means follow his law, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city, meaning New Jerusalem. I said, but wait, there's more. The keeping or doing his commandments is about following God's law. And if you pull up this chart, actually it's one on one. Revelation, Millennium Period Summary 2, top. So all these charts have tops and bottoms, which is high-def uh, pictures I took of the actual charts, which are pretty good size. But they do print out well, and if you just go to a, a copy center, they can just print them right off the site and download them, print them. By the time you can pay for them, they'll have them all printed for you. But you got to print them on something like 11 by 17 or 12 by 18 is a new size I've seen. That's available 12 by 18 is pretty good size uh, you can just put them on paper if you want them to last a long time you can get a, a card stock you can have them print on card stock that's really the better way to go and you should do them in color uh, at least some of them have color some don't but if you do them in color I have a lot of highlights and things on the chart which show up and that's a, a little bit uh, better than just doing black and white so I said on the right, I have this chart on blessed. That's what we were just reading from in related terms in Revelation. Psalms 1 3 is the main cross reference on blessed back to the Old Testament. So, blessed in Revelation connects like this, which we just read. It's about the need to follow uh, God's laws. Abraham did. It says that in Genesis. And 12 17 and 14 12 are the obvious key connections. Yes. 1412, 144,000, and 1217, these children of Sarah, again, are Israelites, Christian Israelites. If they follow God's law and teach the message of Christ, then they're Christian Israel. So, we already know most of these verses, and 1412 is about the redeemed, 144,000 from chapter 7. But uh, so is 1217 connects back to chapter 11 and the two witnesses, which we just saw. The symbology of the woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars and 12 one, that comes from Genesis 37 9. It refers to a sign in heaven or astronomical sign. Has many video posted about it on YouTube. The date, actual date for this event using a, a software was determined by some to be September 23rd, 2017. So the idea is that, uh, well, I've heard uh, some people say it only shows up on that exact 
description only shows up on uh, one this one date, but uh, I've seen others that say it actually happens every seven thousand years. So I don't know. I don't. Uh, I haven't looked at the software, but I've looked at a lot of videos where people have already uh, done it themselves, and that's what you should do. You should go over to YouTube, look at different uh, uh, videos done on it there. And then you have this other astronomical sign of the dragon in 12, 3, and 4. And that, so they looked at that, uh, said, well, that date would be December 13th, 2017. So I put on there's too many good videos to mention just one, but the original video on the subject was done by Scott Clark in 2014. Now he's removed his uh, actual uh, video that he shot then. Uh, here's his channel, so you can go to find his channel and see what he's got. He's got some new ones, uh, at least one uh, new one on it now where he's replaced his older one. And then there's another thing that's worth mentioning uh, that coincides with these dates, and that's the full solar eclipse that happened in the USA on August 8th, 2017. The point about that is there's a second full solar eclipse that will happen approximately seven years later on April 8th, 2024. And these two full solar eclipses cross and have an exact conjunction just south of Carbondale, Illinois. Now I was there at the exact conjunction to the foot. I mean, there's people a mile away, but that's not necessarily an exact conjunction. I was at the exact conjunction. I was blessed to be the only person in the USA to shoot an exact conjunction video, and I, there's a link, you can find it on my uh, YouTube channel. I just, uh, like I said, there's, I'm sure there's people all around that shot uh, conjunction videos that were uh, uh, maybe even uh, the yard next door to where I was, which is what you would consider an exact conjunction. But, uh, I was at the actual spot in the yard of the house where it, it actually happened. So I was the only one there that shot a, a video that day from the actual spot. Giving someone uh, who studies prophecy a date to go by using astronomical signs that only a very few people could determine. In other words, uh, how would you determine if you knew about those uh, conjunction videos or you knew about the uh, September uh, video and so forth, how would you determine that date even if you uh, knew it a thousand years ago? Well, you can do it with software, but without that, there's no way to determine the date. So I'm saying that may be a way to hide the time of the event in chapter 12 of Revelation by restricting, uh, giving you, in other words, something that no one could figure out until the technology would advance enough to allow the date to be calculated. Now we have a software that's actually developed by NASA and you can look it up and put all these parameters in there and break it down to a specific date, but you couldn't have done that uh, even 100 years ago, for example. But you'd also want a second or third witness that that is, uh, that confirms that date. So this conjunction video in these uh, seven uh, years, and they both cross in the United States. In other words, I'm saying there's actually six full solar eclipses which have their conjunctions entirely within the United States. So I don't study astronomy, but I hear this is more than just a, a rare thing. And uh, like I said, I don't really know a whole lot about it. I just uh, read other people's uh, reports on it. But I think it's I think it's uh, germane to what we're reading. So going back to this Genesis uh, 37 9 uh, vision or prophecy, it's, it was a prophecy. I think we've overlooked the full import of what Jacob said about this vision of his favorite son Joseph. His first vision was actually a prophecy. I think it was uh, 37 7 I think, and it was fulfilled maybe 20 years later. And we're all aware that his brothers came to Egypt and bowed to him. So it was a prophecy, and it happened. And keep in mind, they didn't recognize him. That's important because uh, Jacob Israel is not, Christian Israel is not recognized today for whatever reason. And then the second uh, vision or prophecy was the sun and the moon and the 11 stars uh, 
In other words, bowed uh, means uh, expressing deep respect or courtesy, but as before, a superior, a bow, curtsy, or other similar gesture. So, Eleven Stars bowed to uh, Joseph. That's what he was trying to say. But what I'm wondering is, is what was Jacob thinking when he immediately replied, Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to, in other words, you, to earth? Are we going to bow to you? Well, Israel then is assuming at that point it was about him and, and Rachel and his brothers. So you see, he put him in the place of uh, the sun and his mother in place of the moon and brothers as the stars. So he just immediately tied it to the signs in the, in the heavens, in other words. But the symbology of Revelation chapter 12 is a woman with a crown of 12 stars. That wouldn't be Rachel because she didn't have all 12 tribes, but there was prophecy with Sarah. I said, there's no prophecy that I know of where we could apply that thought to Rachel, but we could apply it to Sarah because in Genesis chapter 17, both Abraham and Sarah was giving an everlasting covenant to produce nations and kings of their future posterity. By the time Israel was ready to die in Genesis chapter 48 and 49, we read where he says that Yehoah showed him what Joseph's sons would do in the future. So he got that directly uh, in Yehoah's Christ. So he got that directly from Christ. In other words, this vision of what Joseph's sons were going to do. And it says even when he couldn't see well enough to determine which child was Ephraim and Manasseh when he put his hands on them, he knew from the spirit of Yehoah to cross his hands so the correct prophecy was given to each son. That's Genesis 48.11. If we look at the full import of what he did here, Jacob was passing his power with God, or Yehoah, because that's what the word Israel means. So Jacob became Israel, which meant power with God, ruling with God, that kind of thing. So he passed his power with God, or power with Yehoah, to Joseph, but specifically to Joseph's two sons he had with the daughter of a priest. By his words... Then he narrated it to just these two, and he called them lads, and he did that twice. The rendering of Genesis chapter 48, 48, 16, and the various King James versions I've looked at, I just there's no way they compare to how for my uh, Ferrar Fenton. That's what FF, my initialism, FF is Ferrar Fenton. If you look at a Ferrar Fenton Bible, it's still available today. It's uh, got very good wording in most aspects, not always, but I like it. Uh, in this case, uh, it renders it very well. Bless the lads, give them my power, the power of my father, speaking of Abraham and Isaac, pour out their increase to the bounds of the earth. Then 48.21, God be with you, and the following 49.22-26, by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob, from whom is Israel's guardian stone. That's Christ the stone, or Christ the rock, from the New Testament. May the God of your father guard you, or shield you. That's the promise from Genesis 15.1. I've covered that in many videos. These all connect the stone, the shield, and the scepter, and all in Genesis it's about Christ. So this is the proper context of what this prophecy is all about. All of Israel knew of the concept of Jehovah the shield who protected his people starting in Genesis chapter 12 in the correct context when you realize that the Abrahamic covenant quotes directly to Acts and John as you see on my Old Testament quotes chart and how it reads in those verses to the New Testament. Actually we got it below so we're going to come to it in a minute. So when you topically focus on Christ the rock or stone in the New Testament, you realize there are more verses dedicated to that subject in the New Testament than anything else. Yes. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that, but when you actually uh, look at how they all cross-reference and what they cross-reference to, it's actually more 
about Christ the Rock in the New Testament than anything, uh, verse-wise. <coughs> Excuse me. So, I'm have one more. So, when you see the connection to Yehoah as the scepter of Judah, from Genesis 49.10, that's the king of Judah or horn of salvation in Psalms, in other words. This is also the most used cross reference in the New Testament about the origin of Christ, the prophet, or the Messiah. Those uh, three, th all those things interconnect, Christ the rock, Christ the stone, Christ the prophet, Christ the Messiah. I want, so if you realize all that connects, and it connects to the Old Testament, there's more verses, many more verses on Christ the rock in the New Testament than any other subject matter. And you should compare, compare this to the blessing by Moses in Deuteronomy 33, 13 to 17 as well, because over there Moses restates his prophecy in chapter 12 of Revelation, but uses the term sun, moon, crown, meaning crown of 12 stars, which is his brothers, and that he will conquer nations and unite all 12 kindred tribes together as a noble or prince. So, and then uh, 33 of Deuteronomy 29 sums up a victor race for Yehoah, your shield, your help, and your sword. So that's Christ the rock, Christ the shield, king of Judah. You shall grow and subdue your foes, which means conquer. Of course, no King James versions use the term race in their translations. They took that out, but that's what the word meant. I would like to point out that if a white person today is labeled racist, that means a person who shows or feels discrimination or prejudice against people of other races or believes that a particular race is superior to another, that's what the word means, races, then definable races must exist to allow us to use the term. Because a few very notable people today have made recent claims that there are no definable races. So how do you use the term? The term connects, so you can't have one without the other. So let's end it here and come back, uh, and this will just be part two here at this section where we ended up with the racist thing, and we'll come back with... Uh, well, uh, it'll be part three, so we'll come back with part three, and thank you for watching.